Can Jane Witherstein handle another devastating blow to her livelihood? How many hits can her trembling loyalty take? Zane Grey, today on the Classic Tales podcast. Welcome to the Classic Tales podcast. Thank you for listening. We are proudly supported by our listeners. We couldn't do this without you. Your monthly donation helps in so many ways, and it also gives you access to more classic titles. Go to ClassicTalesAudiobooks.com and become a financial supporter today. Thank you so much. The Arzenlu podcast is plugging along. Six episodes are now available. Be sure to subscribe to our Gentleman Burglar's own show and tell your friends. Links can be found in the show notes. And if you'd like to listen and review the amazing audiobook Cuban Sun Rising by Charles Gomez, please reach out to mail at classictalesaudiobooks.com. I'll send you a free copy. Thanks for your help. And now, Riders of the Purple Sage, Part 6 of 12 by Zane Gray. Chapter 12. The Invisible Hand Jane received a letter from Bishop Dyer, not in his own handwriting, which stated that the abrupt termination of their interview had left him in some doubt as to her future conduct. A slight injury had incapacitated him from seeking another meeting at present, the letter went on to say, and ended with a request which was virtually a command that she call upon him at once. The reading of the letter acquainted Jane Witherstein with the fact that something within her had all but changed. She sent no reply to Bishop Dyer, nor did she go to see him. On Sunday, she remained absent from the service, for the second time in years, and though she did not actually suffer, there was a deadlock of feelings deep within her, and the waiting for a balance to fall on either side was almost as bad as suffering. She had a gloomy expectancy of untoward circumstances, and with it, a keen-edged curiosity to watch developments. She had a half-formed conviction that her future conduct, as related to her churchmen, was beyond her control and would be governed by their attitude toward her. Something was changing in her, forming, waiting for decision to make it a real and fixed thing. She had told Lassiter that she felt helpless and lost in the fateful tangle of their lives, and now she feared that she was approaching the same chaotic condition of mind in regard to her religion. It appalled her to find that she questioned phases of that religion. Absolute faith had been her serenity. Though leaving her faith unshaken, her serenity had been disturbed and now it was broken by open war between her and her ministers. That something within her, a whisper, which she had tried in vain to hush, had become a ringing voice, and had called to her to wait. She had transgressed no laws of God. Her churchmen, however, invested with the power and the glory of a wonderful creed, however they sat in inexorable judgment of her, must now practice toward her the simple, common, Christian virtue they professed to preach. Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Jane Witherstein, waiting in darkness of mind, remained faithful still. But it was darkness that must soon be pierced by light. If her faith were justified, if her churchmen were trying only to intimidate her, the fact would soon be manifest, as would their failure, and then she would redouble her zeal toward them and toward what had been the best work of her life, work for the welfare and happiness of those among whom she lived, Mormon and Gentile alike. If that secret intangible power closed its coils round her again, if that great invisible hand moved here and there and everywhere, slowly paralyzing her with its mystery and its inconceivable sway over her affairs, then she would know beyond doubt 
that it was not chance, nor jealousy, nor intimidation, nor ministerial wrath at her revolt, but a cold and calculating policy, thought out long before she was born, a dark, immutable will, of whose empire she and all that was hers was but an atom. Then might come her ruin. Then might come her fall into black storm. Yet she would rise again, and to the light. God would be merciful to a driven woman who had lost her way. A week passed. Little Fay played and prattled and pulled at Lassiter's big black guns. The rider came to Witherstein House oftener than ever. Jane saw a change in him, though it did not relate to his kindness and gentleness. He was quieter and more thoughtful. While playing with Fay or conversing with Jane, he seemed to be possessed of another self that watched with cool, roving eyes, that listened, listened always as if the murmuring amber stream brought messages and the moving leaves whispered something. Lassiter never rode bells into the court any more, nor did he come by the lane or the paths. When he appeared, it was suddenly and noiselessly out of the dark shadow of the grove. I left bells out in the sage, he said one day at the end of that week. I must carry water to him. Why not let him drink at the trough or here? asked Jane quickly. I reckon it'll be safer for me to slip through the grove. I've been watched when I rode in from the sage. Watched? By whom? By a man who thought he was well hid. But my eyes are pretty sharp. And Jane, he went on, almost in a whisper. I reckon it'd be a good idea for us to talk low. You're spied on here by your women. Lassiter, she whispered in turn. That's hard to believe. My women love me. What of that? He asked. Of course they love you. But they're Mormon women. Jane's old rebellious loyalty clashed with her doubt. I won't believe it, she replied stubbornly. Well then, just act natural and talk natural and pretty soon give them time to hear us. Pretend to go over there to the table and then quick like make a move for the door and open it. I will, said Jane with heightened color. Lassiter was right. He never made mistakes. He would not have told her unless he positively knew. Yet Jane was so tenacious of faith that she had to see with her own eyes, and so constituted that to employ even such small deceit toward her women made her ashamed, and angry for her shame as well as theirs. Then a singular thought confronted her that made her hold up this simple ruse, which hurt her, though it was well justified, against the deceit she had wittingly and eagerly used toward Lassiter. The difference was staggering in its suggestion of that blindness of which he had accused her. Fairness and justice and mercy that she had imagined were anchor cables to hold fast her soul to righteousness had not been hers in that strange, biased duty that had so exalted and confounded her. Presently Jane began to act her little part, to laugh and play with Fay, to talk of horses and cattle to Lassiter. Then she made deliberate mention of a book in which she kept records of all pertaining to her stock, and she walked slowly toward the table, and when near the door she suddenly whirled and thrust it open. Her sharp action nearly knocked down a woman who had undoubtedly been listening. Hester, said Jane sternly, you may go home, and you need not come back. Jane shut the door and returned to Lassiter. Standing unsteadily, she put her hand on his arm. She let him see that doubt had gone, and how this stab of disloyalty pained her. Spies! My own women. Oh, miserable, she cried with flashing, tearful eyes. I hate to tell you, he replied. By that she knew he had long spared her. It's begun again, that work in the dark. Nay, Lassiter, 
it never stopped. So bitter certainty claimed her at last, and trust fled Witherstein House and fled forever. The women who owed much to Jane Witherstein changed not in love for her, nor in devotion to their household work, but they poisoned both by a thousand acts of stealth and cunning and duplicity. Jane broke out once and caught them in strange, stone-faced, unhesitating falsehood. Thereafter she broke out no more. She forgave them because they were driven, poor, fettered, and sealed Hagars. How she pitied them. What terrible thing bound them and locked their lips, when they showed neither consciousness of guilt toward their benefactress, nor distress at the slow wearing apart of long-established and dear ties. The blindness again, cried Jane Witherstein. In my sisters as in me, oh God! There came a time when no words passed between Jane and her women. Silently, they went about their household duties, and secretly, they went about the underhand work to which they had been bidden. The gloom of the house and the gloom of its mistress, which darkened even the bright spirit of little Fay, did not pervade these women. Happiness was not among them, but they were aloof from gloom. They spied and listened. They received and sent secret messengers, and they stole Jane's books and records, and finally the papers that were the deeds of her possessions. Through it all they were silent, wrapped in a kind of trance. Then one by one, without leave or explanation or farewell, they left Witherstein House and never returned. Coincident with this disappearance, Jane's gardeners and workers in the alfalfa fields and stablemen quit her, not even asking for their wages. Of all her Mormon employees about the great ranch, only Jurd remained. He went on with his duty, but talked no more of the change than if it had never occurred. Jurd, said Jane, what stock you can't take care of, turn out in the sage. Let your first thought be for black star and night. Keep them in perfect condition. Run them every day and watch them always. Though Jane Witherstein gave them such liberality, she loved her possessions. She loved the rich, green stretches of alfalfa, and the farms, and the grove, and the old stone house, and the beautiful, ever-faithful amber spring, and every one of a myriad of horses and colts and burrows and fowls, down to the smallest rabbit that nipped her vegetables. But she loved best her noble Arabian steeds. In common with all riders of the upland sage, Jane cherished two material things, the cold, sweet, brown water that made life possible in the wilderness, and the horses, which were a part of that life. When Lassiter asked her what Lassiter would be without his guns, he was assuming that his horse was part of himself. So Jane loved Black Star and Knight because it was her nature to love all beautiful creatures, perhaps all living things. And then she loved them because she herself was of the sage, and in her had been born and bred the rider's instinct to rely on his four-footed brother. And when Jane gave Jurd the order to keep her favorites trained down to the day, it was a half-conscious admission that presaged a time when she would need her fleet horses. Jane had now, however, no leisure to brood over the coils that were closing round her. Mrs. Larkin grew weaker as the August days began. She required constant care. There was little Fay to look after, and such household work as was imperative. Lassiter put bells in the stable with the other racers, and directed his efforts to a closer attendance upon Jane. She welcomed the change. He was always at hand to help and it was her fortune to learn that his boast of being awkward around women had its root in humility, and was not true. His great, brown hands were skilled in a multiplicity of ways which a woman might have envied. He shared Jane's work, and was of especial help to her in nursing Mrs. Larkin. The woman suffered most at night, 
and this often broke Jane's rest. So it came about that Lassiter would stay by Mrs. Larkin during the day, when she needed care, and Jane would make up the sleep she lost in night watches. Mrs. Larkin at once took kindly to the gentle Lassiter, and without ever asking who or what he was, praised him to Jane. He's a good man and loves children, she said. How sad to hear this truth spoken of a man whom Jane thought lost beyond all redemption. Yet ever and ever, Lassiter towered above her, and behind or through his black sinister figure shone something luminous that strangely affected Jane. Good and evil began to seem incomprehensibly blended in her judgment. It was her belief that evil should not come forth from good, Yet here was a murderer who dwarfed in gentleness, patience, and love any man she had ever known. She had almost lost track of her more outside concerns when early one morning Judkins presented himself before her in the courtyard, thin, hard, burnt, bearded, with the dust and sage thick on him, with his leather wristbands shining from use and his boots worn through on the stirrup side, he looked the rider of riders. He wore two guns and carried a Winchester. Jane greeted him with surprise and warmth, set meat and bread and drink before him, and called Lassiter out to see him. The men exchanged glances, and the meaning of Lassiter's keen inquiry and Judkins's bold reply, both unspoken, was not lost upon Jane. Where's your horse? asked Lassiter aloud. Lift him down the slope, answered Judkins. I footed it in a ways, and slept last night in the sage. I went to the place you told me you most always slept, but it didn't strike you. I moved up some, near the spring, and now I go there nights. Judkins? The white herd? queried Jane, hurriedly. Miss Witherstein, I make proud to say I've not lost a steer. For a good while after that stampede lasted a milled, we had no trouble. Uh, even the sage dogs left us. But it's begun again. That flashing of lights over ridge tips and queer puffing of smoke. And then at night, strange whistles and noises. But the herds acted magnificent. And my boys, say, Miss Witherstein, they're only kids. But I ask no better riders. I got the laugh in the village for taking them out. They're a wild lot. And you know boys have more nerve than grown men, because they don't know what danger is. Now, I'm not denying there's danger, but they glory in it, and maybe I like it myself. Anyway, we'll stick. We're going to drive the herd on the far side of the first break of Deception Pass. There's a great round valley over there, and no ridges or piles of rocks to aid these stampeders. The rains are due. We'll have plenty of water for a while. And yeah, we can hold that herd from anybody except Aldrin. I come in for supplies. I'll pack a couple of burrows and drive out after dark tonight. Judkins, take what you want from the storeroom. Lassiter will help you. I... I can't thank you enough, but... Wait. Jane went to the room that had once been her father's, and from a secret chamber in the thick stone wall, she took a bag of gold, and carrying it back to the court... She gave it to the rider. There, Judkins, and understand that I regard it as little for your loyalty. Give what is fair to your boys and keep the rest. Hide it. Perhaps that would be wisest. Oh, Miss Witherstein, ejaculated the rider. I couldn't earn so much in ten years. It's not right. I oughtn't to take it. Judkins, you know I'm a rich woman. I tell you, I've few faithful friends. I've fallen upon evil days. God only knows what will become of me and mine, so take the gold. She smiled in understanding of his speechless gratitude and left him with Lassiter. Presently she heard him speaking low at first, then in louder accents, emphasized by the thumping of his rifle on the stones. As infernal a job as even you, Lassiter, ever heard of. My son, was Lassiter's reply. This breaking of Miss Witherstein may seem bad to you, but it ain't bad yet. 
some of these wall-eyed fellers who look just as if they was walking in the shadow of Christ himself, right down the sunny road. Now they can think of things and do things that are really hell-bent. Jane covered her ears and ran to her own room, and there, like a caged lioness, she paced to and fro, till the coming of little Fay reversed her dark thoughts. The following day, a warm and muggy one threatening rain while Jane was resting in the court, a horseman clattered through the grove and up to the hitching rack. He leaped off and approached Jane with the manner of a man determined to execute a difficult mission, yet fearful of its reception. In the gaunt, wiry figure and the lean brown face, Jane recognized one of her Mormon riders, Blake. It was he of whom Judkins had long since spoken. Of all the riders ever in her employ, Blake owed her the most, and as he stepped before her, removing his hat and making manly efforts to subdue his emotion, he showed that he remembered. Miss Witherstein, mother's dead, he said. Oh, Blake, exclaimed Jane, and she could say no more. She died free from pain in the end, and she's buried, resting at last, thank God. I've come to ride for you again, if you'll have me. Don't think I mentioned mother to get your sympathy. When she was living and your riders quit, I had to also. I was afraid of what might be done, said to her. Miss Witherstein, we can't talk of, of what's going on now. Blake, do you know? I know a great deal. You understand my lips are shut. But without explanation or excuse, I offer my services. I'm a Mormon. I hope a good one. But there are some things... It's no use, Miss Witherstein. I can't say any more what I'd like to. But will you take me back? Blake, you know what it means. I don't care. I'm sick of... of I'll show you a Mormon who'll be true to you. But Blake, how terribly you might suffer for that. Maybe. Aren't you suffering now? God knows indeed I am. Miss Witherstein, it's a liberty on my part to speak so, but I know you pretty well. No, you'll never give in. I wouldn't if I were you. And I, I must. Something makes me tell you the worst is yet to come. That's all. I absolutely can't say more. Will you take me back? Let me ride for you? Show everybody what I mean? Blake, it makes me happy to hear you. How my riders hurt me when they quit. Jane felt the hot tears well to her eyes and splashed down upon her hands. I thought so much of them, tried so hard to be good to them, and not one was true. You've made it easy to forgive. Perhaps many of them really feel as you do, but dare not return to me. Still, Blake, I hesitate to take you back, yet I want you so much. Do it then. If you're going to make your life a lesson to Mormon women, let me make mine a lesson to the men. Right is right. I believe in you. And here's my life to prove it. You hint it may mean your life, said Jane, breathless and low. We won't speak of that. I want to come back. I want to do what every rider aches in his secret heart to do for you. Miss Witherstein, I hoped it had not be necessary to tell you that my mother, on her deathbed, told me to have courage. She knew how the thing galled me. She told me to come back. Will you take me? God bless you, Blake. Yes, I'll take you back. And will you... Will you accept gold from me? Miss Witherstein? I just gave Judkins a bag of gold. I'll give you one. If you will not take it, you must not come back. You might ride for me a few months, weeks, days till the storm breaks. Then you'll have nothing and be in disgrace with your people. We'll forearm you against poverty and me against endless regret. I'll give you gold which you can hide till some future time. Well, if it pleases you, replied Blake. But you know, I never thought of pay. Now, Miss Witherstein, one thing more. I want to see this man, Lassiter. Is he here? Yes, but Blake, what need you to see him? Why? 
asked Jane, instantly worried. I can speak to him. Tell him about you. That won't do. I want to... I've got to tell him myself. Where is he? Lassiter is with Mrs. Larkin. She is ill. I'll call him, answered Jane. And going to the door, she softly called for the rider. A faint, musical jingle preceded his step. Then his tall form crossed the threshold. Lassiter, here's Blake, an old rider of mine. He has come back to me, and he wishes to speak to you. Blake's brown face turned exceedingly pale. Yes, I had to speak to you, he said swiftly. My name's Blake. I'm a Mormon and a rider. Lately I quit Miss Witherstein. I've come to beg her to take me back. Now I don't know you, but I know what you are. So I have this to say to your face. It would never occur to this woman to imagine, let alone suspect, me to be a spy. She couldn't think it might be just a low plot to come here and shoot you in the back. Jane Witherstein hasn't that kind of a mind. Well, I've not come for that. I want to help her, to pull her bridle along with Judkins and... and you. The thing is, do you believe me? I reckon I do, replied Lassiter. How this slow, cool speech contrasted with Blake's hot, impulsive words. You might have saved some of your breath. See here, Blake, cinch this in your mind. Lassiter has met some square Mormons. And maybe... Blake, interrupted Jane, nervously anxious to terminate a colloquy that she perceived was an ordeal for him. Go at once and fetch me a report of my horses. Miss Witherstein, you mean the big drove down in the sage-cleared fields? Of course, replied Jane. My horses are all there, except the blooded stock I keep here. Haven't you heard, then? Heard? No. What's happened to them? They're gone, Miss Witherstein. Gone these ten days past. Dorn told me, and I rode down to see for myself. Lassiter, did you know? Asked Jane, whirling to him. I reckon so. But what was the use to tell you? It was Lassiter turning away his face, and Blake studying the stone flags at his feet that brought Jane to the understanding of what she betrayed. She strove desperately, but she could not rise immediately from such a blow. My horses! My horses! What's become of them? Dorn said the riders report another drive by Oldring, and I trailed the horses miles down the slope toward Deception Pass. My red herd's gone. My horse is gone. The white herd will go next. I can stand that, but if I lost Black Star and Knight, it would be like parting with my own flesh and blood. Lassiter? Blake? Am I in danger of losing my racers? A rustler, or... Or anybody stealing horses of yours will most of all want the blacks, said Lassiter. His evasive reply was affirmative enough. The other rider nodded gloomy acquiescence. Oh, oh, Jane Witherstein choked with violent utterance. Let me take charge of the blacks, asked Blake. One more rider won't be any great help to Judkins, but I might hold Black Star and Knight if you put such store in their value. Value? Blake, I love my racers. Besides, there's another reason why I mustn't lose them. You go to the stables. Go with Jerd every day when he runs the horses, and don't let them out of your sight. If you would please me, win my gratitude. Guard my black racers. When Blake had mounted and ridden out of the court, Lassiter regarded Jane with a smile that was becoming rarer as the days sped by. Appears to me, as Blake says, you do put some store on them horses. Now, I ain't gainsaying that the Arabians are the handsomest horses I ever seen, but Bells can beat night and run neck and neck with Black Star. Lassiter, don't tease me now. I'm miserable, sick. Bells is fast, but he can't stay with the blacks, and you know it. Only Wrangle can do that. I'll bet that big, raw-boned brute can do more and show his heels to your black racers. Jane out there in the sage, on long chase, Wrangle could kill your favorites. 
No, no, replied Jane impatiently. Lassiter, why do you say that so often? I know you've teased me at times, and I believe it's only kindness. You're always trying to keep my mind off worry. But you mean more by this repeated mention of my racers. I reckon so. Lassiter paused, and for the thousandth time in her presence, moved his black sombrero round and round, as if counting the silver pieces on the band. Well, Jane, I sort of read a little that's passing in your mind. You think I might fly from my home, from Cottonwoods, from the Utah border? I reckon. And if you ever do and get away with the blacks, I wouldn't like to see Wrangle left here on the sage. Wrangle would catch you. I know Venters had him, but you can never tell. Maybe he hasn't got him now. Besides, things are happening, and something of the same queer nature might have happened to Venters. God knows you're right. Poor Byrne. How long he's gone. In my trouble I've been forgetting him. But Lassiter, I've little fear for him. I've heard my riders say he's as keen as a wolf. As to your reading my thoughts, well, your suggestion makes an actual thought of what was only one of my dreams. I believe I dreamed of flying from this wild borderland, Lassiter. I've strange dreams. I'm not always practical and thinking of my many duties, as you said once. For instance, if I dared, if I dared, I'd ask you to saddle the blacks and ride away with me, and hide me. Jane. The rider's sunburnt face turned white. A few times Jane had seen Lassiter's cool calm broken, when he had met little Fay, when he had learned how and why he had come to love both child and mistress. When he had stood beside Millie Earn's grave. But one and all, they could not be considered in the light of his present agitation. Not only did Lassiter turn white, not only did he grow tense, not only did he lose his coolness, but also he suddenly, violently, hungrily, took her into his arms and crushed her to his breast. Lassiter, cried Jane, trembling. It was an action for which she took sole blame. Instantly, as if dazed, weakened, he released her. Forgive me, went on Jane. I'm always forgetting your, your feelings. I thought of you as my faithful friend. I'm always making you out more than human, only, let me say, I meant that, about riding away. I'm wretched. Sick of this, this, oh, something bitter and black grows on my heart. Jane, the hell of it, he replied with a deep intake of breath, is you can't ride away. Maybe realizing it accounts for my grabbing you in that way, as much as the crazy boy's rapture your words gave me. I don't understand myself. But the hell of this game is... You can't ride away. Lassiter, what on earth do you mean? I'm an absolutely free woman. You ain't absolutely anything of the kind. I reckon I've got to tell you. Tell me all. It's uncertainty that makes me a coward. It's faith and hope, blind love, if you will, that makes me miserable. Every day I awake believing, still believing. The day grows, and with it, doubts fears, and that black bat hate that bites hotter and hotter into my heart. Then night comes. I pray. I pray for all and for myself. I sleep, and I awake free once more, trustful, faithful, to believe, to hope. Then, oh my God, I grow and live a thousand years till night again. But if you want to see me a woman, Tell me why I can't ride away. Tell me what more I'm to lose. Tell me the worst. Jane, you watched. There's no single move of yours, except when you're hidden your house, that ain't seen by sharp eyes. The cottonwood grove's full of creeping, crawling men, like Indians in the grass. When you rode, 
which wasn't often lately. The sage was full of sneaking men. At night they'd crawl under your windows into the court, and I reckon into the house. Jane Witherstein, you know, never locked a door. This here grove's a humming beehive of mysterious happenings. Jane, it ain't so much that these spies keep out of my way as me keeping out of theirs. They're going to try to kill me, that's plain. But maybe I'm as hard to shoot in the back as in the face. So far I've seen fit to watch only. This all means, Jane, that you're a marked woman. You can't get away, not now. Maybe later, when you're broken, you might. But that's sure doubtful. Jane, you are to lose the cattle that's left, your home and ranch and Amber Spring. You can't even hide a sack of gold, for it couldn't be slipped out of the house, day or night, and hid or buried, let alone be rid off with. You may lose all. I'm telling you, Jane, hoping to prepare you, if the worst does come. I told you once before about that strange power I've got to feel things. Lassiter, what can I do? Nothing, I reckon, except know what's coming, and wait and be game. If you'd let me make a call on Tull, and a long deferred call on hush, hush, she whispered. Well, even that wouldn't help you any in the end. What does it mean? What does it mean? I am my father's daughter, a Mormon, yet I can't see. I've not failed my religion, in duty. For years I've given with a free and full heart. When my father died, I was rich. If I'm still rich, it's because I couldn't find enough ways to become poor. What am I? What are my possessions to set in motion such intensity of secret oppression? Jane, the man behind it all is an empire builder. But Lassiter, I would give freely all I own to avert this, this wretched thing. If I gave, that would leave me with faith still. Surely my my churchmen think of my soul. If I lose my trust in them, child, be still, said Lassiter, with a dark dignity that had in it something of pity. You are a woman, fine and big and strong, and your heart matches your size. But in mind, you're a child. And I'll say a little more, then I'm done. I'll never mention this again. Among many thousands of women, you're one who has bucked against your churchmen. They tried you out and failed of persuasion and finally of threats. You meet now the cold steel of a will as far from Christ-like as the universe is wide. You're to be broken. Your body's to be held, given to some man, made, if possible, to bring children into the world. But your soul? <laughs> what do they care for your soul? Chapter 13 Solitude and Storm in his hidden valley, Venters awakened from sleep, and his ears rang with innumerable melodies from full-throated mockingbirds, and his eyes opened wide upon the glorious golden shaft of sunlight shining through the great stone bridge. The circle of cliffs surrounding Surprise Valley lay shrouded in morning mist, a dim blue low down along the terraces, a creamy moving cloud along the ramparts, the oak forest in the center was a plumed and tufted oval of gold. He saw Bess under the spruces. Upon her complete recovery of strength, she always rose with the dawn. At the moment, she was feeding the quail she had tamed. And she had begun to tame the mockingbirds. They fluttered among the branches overhead, and some left off their songs to flit down and shyly hop near the twittering quail. Little gray and white rabbits crouched in the grass, now nibbling, now laying long ears flat and watching the dogs. Venter's swift glance took in the brightening valley, and Bess, and her pets, and Ring and Whitey. It swept over all 
to return again and rest upon the girl. She had changed. To the dark trousers and blouse, she had added moccasins of her own make, but she no longer resembled a boy. No eye could have failed to mark the rounded contours of a woman. The change had been to grace and beauty. A glint of warm gold gleamed from her hair, and a tint of red shone in the clear dark brown of cheeks. The haunting sweetness of her lips and eyes, that earlier had been elusive, a promise, had become a living fact. She fitted harmoniously into that wonderful setting. She was like Surprise Valley, wild and beautiful. Venters leaped out of his cave to begin the day. He had postponed his journey to Cottonwoods until after the passing of the summer rains. The rains were due soon. But until their arrival and the necessity for his trip to the village, he sequestered in a far corner of mind all thought of peril, of his past life, and almost that of the present. It was enough to live. He did not want to know what lay hidden in the dim and distant future. Surprise Valley had enchanted him. In this home of the cliff dwellers, there were peace and quiet and solitude. And another thing, wondrous as the golden morning shaft of sunlight that he dared not ponder over long enough to understand. The solitude he had hated when alone, he had now come to love. He was assimilating something from this valley of gleams and shadows. From this strange girl, he was assimilating more. The day at hand resembled many days gone before. As Venters had no tools with which to build or to till the terraces, he remained idle. Beyond the cooking of the simple fare, there were no tasks. And as there were no tasks, there was no system. He and Bess began one thing to leave it, to begin another to leave that, and then do nothing but lie under the spruces and watch the great cloud sails majestically move along the ramparts, and dream and dream. The valley was a golden, sunlit world. It was silent. The sighing wind and the twittering quail and the singing birds, even the rare and seldom occurring hollow crack of a sliding weathered stone, only thickened and deepened that insulated silence. Venters and Bess had vagrant minds, Best did I ever tell you about my horse, Wrangle? inquired Venters. A hundred times, she replied. Oh, have I? I'd forgotten. I want you to see him. He'll carry us both. I'd like to ride him. Can he run? Run? He's a demon. Swiftest horse on the sage. I hope he'll stay in that canyon. He'll stay. They left camp to wander along the terraces, into the aspen ravines, under the gleaming walls. Ring and Whitey wandered in the fore, often turning, often trotting back, open-mouthed and solemn-eyed and happy. Venters lifted his gaze to the grand archway over the entrance to the valley, and Bess lifted hers to follow his, and both were silent. Sometimes the bridge held their attention for a long time. Today a soaring eagle attracted them. How he sails! exclaimed Bess. I wonder where his mate is. If she's at the nest. It's on the bridge in a crack near the top. I see her often. She's almost white. They wandered on down the terrace, into the shady, sun-flecked forest. A brown bird fluttered, crying from a bush. Bess peeped into the leaves. Look, a nest and four little birds. They're not afraid of us. See how they open their mouths? They're hungry. Rabbits rustled the dead brush and pattered away. The forest was full of a drowsy hum of insects. Little darts of purple, that were running quail, crossed the glades. And a plaintive, sweet peeping came from the coverts. Bess's soft step disturbed a sleeping lizard that scampered away over the leaves. She gave chase and caught it, a slim creature of nameless color but of exquisite beauty. Jewel eyes, she said. It's like a rabbit, afraid. We won't eat you. There, go. Murmuring water drew their steps downward into a shallow, shaded ravine where a brown brook 
brawled softly over mossy stones. Multitudes of strange gray frogs with white spots and black eyes lined the rocky bank and leaped only at close approach. Then Venters's eye descried a very thin, very long green snake coiled round a sapling. They drew closer and closer till they could have touched it. The snake had no fear and watched them with scintillating eyes. It's pretty, said Bess. How tame. I thought snakes always ran. No, even the rabbits didn't run here till the dogs chased them. On and on they wandered to the wild jumble of mast and broken fragments of cliff at the west end of the valley. The roar of the disappearing stream dinned in their ears. Into this maze of rocks they threaded a torturous way, climbing, descending, halting to gather wild plums and great lavender lilies, and going on at the will of fancy. Idle and keen perceptions guided them equally. Oh, let us climb there, cried Bess, pointing upward to a small space of terrace left green and shady between huge abutments of broken cliff. And they climbed to the nook and rested, and looked out across the valley to the curling column of blue smoke from their campfire. But the cool shade and the rich grass and the fine view were not what they had climbed for. They could not have told, although whatever had drawn them was well satisfying. Light, sure-footed as a mountain goat, Bess pattered down at Venters' heels. And they went on, calling the dogs, eyes dreamy and wide, listening to the wind and the bees and the crickets and the birds. Part of the time Ring and Whitey led the way, then Venters, then Bess. And the direction was not an object. They left the sun-streaked shade of the oaks, brushed the long grass of the meadows, entered the green and fragrant swaying willows, to stop, at length, under the huge old cottonwoods where the beavers were busy. Here they rested and watched. A dam of brush and logs and mud and stones backed the stream into a little lake. The round, rough beaver houses projected from the water. Like the rabbits, the beavers had become shy. Gradually, however, as Venters and Bess knelt low, holding the dogs, the beavers emerged to swim with logs and gnaw at cottonwoods and pat mud walls with their paddle-like tails and glossy and shiny in the sun to go on with their strange, persistent industry. They were the builders. The lake was a mud hole, and the immediate environment a scarred and dead region. But it was a wonderful home of wonderful animals. Look at that one. He puddles in the mud, said Bess. And there, see him dive. Hear them gnawing. I'd think they'd break their teeth. How's it they can stay out of the water and under the water? And she laughed. Then Venters and Bess wandered further, and perhaps not all unconsciously this time, wended their slow steps to the cave of the cliff dwellers, where she liked best to go. The tangled thicket and the long slant of dust and little chips of weathered rock and the steep bench of stone and the worn steps all were arduous work for Bess in the climbing. But she gained the shelf, gasping, hot of cheek, glad of eye, with her hand in Venters's. Here they rested. The beautiful valley glittered below with its millions of wind-turned leaves, bright-faced in the sun, and the mighty bridge towered heavenward, crowned with blue sky. Bess, however, never rested for long. Soon she was exploring, and Venters followed. She dragged forth from corners and shelves a multitude of crudely fashioned and painted pieces of pottery, and he carried them. They peeped down into the dark holes of the kivas, and Bess gleefully dropped a stone and waited for the long-coming hollow sound to rise. They peeped into the little globular houses, like mud-wasp nests, and wondered if these had been store places for grain, or baby cribs, or what. And they crawled into the larger houses and laughed when they bumped their heads on the low roofs, and they dug in the dust of the floors, and they brought from dust and darkness armloads of treasure, which they carried to the light. Flints and stones, and strange curved sticks and pottery they found, and twisted grass rope, 
that crumbled in their hands, and bits of whitish stone, which crushed to powder at a touch and seemed to vanish in the air. That white stuff was bone, said Venters slowly. Bones of a cliff dweller. No, exclaimed Bess. Here's another piece. Look. Phew. Dry, powdery smoke. That's bone. Then it was that Venters's primitive, childlike mood, like a savage's, seeing yet unthinking, gave way to the encroachment of civilized thought. The world had not been made for a single day's play, or fancy, or idle watching. The world was old. Nowhere could be gotten a better idea of its age than in this gigantic, silent tomb. The gray ashes in Venter's hand had once been bone of a human being like himself. The pale gloom of the cave had shadowed people long ago. He saw that Bess had received the same shock, could not in moments such as this escape her feeling, living, thinking destiny. Burn, people have lived here, she said, with wide, thoughtful eyes. Yes, he replied. How long ago? A thousand years and more. What were they? Cliff dwellers, men who had enemies and made their homes high out of reach. They had to fight? Yes. They fought for what? For life? For their homes, food, children, parents? For their women? Has the world changed any in a thousand years? I don't know. Perhaps a little. Of men? I hope so. I think so. Things crowd into my mind, she went on, and the wistful light in her eyes told Venters the truth of her thoughts. I've ridden the border of Utah. I've seen people, know how they live. But they must be few of all who are living. I had my books and I studied them, but all that doesn't help me anymore. I want to go out into the big world and see it. Yet I want to stay here more. What's to become of us? Are we cliff dwellers? We are alone here. I'm happy when I don't think these... these bones that fly into dust. They make me sick. And a little afraid. Do the people who lived here once have the same feelings as we have? What was the good of their living at all? They're gone. What's the meaning of it all? Of us? Bess, you ask more than I can tell. It's beyond me. Only there was laughter here once, and now there's silence. There was life, and now there's death. Men cut these little steps, made these arrowheads and mealing stones, plated the ropes we found, and left their bones to crumble in our fingers. As far as time is concerned, it might have all been yesterday. We are here today. Maybe we are higher in the scale of human beings, in intelligence, but who knows? We can't be any higher in the things for which life is lived at all. What are they? Why, I suppose relationship, friendship, love, love. Yes, love of man for woman, love of woman for man. That's the nature, the meaning, the best of life itself. She said no more. Wistfulness of glance deepened into sadness. Come, let us go, said Venters. Action brightened her. Beside him, holding his hand, she slipped down the shelf, ran down the long, steep slant of sliding stones, out of the cloud of dust, and likewise out of the pale gloom. We beat the slide, she cried. The miniature avalanche cracked and roared and rattled itself into an inert mass at the base of the incline, yellow dust like the gloom of the cave, but not so changeless, drifted away on the wind. The roar clapped in echo from the cliff, returned, went back and came again to die in the hollowness. 
Down on the sunny terrace there was a different atmosphere. Ring and Whitey leaped around Bess. Once more she was smiling, gay, and thoughtless, with the dream mood in the shadow of her eyes. Bess, I haven't seen that since last summer. Look, said Venters, pointing to the scalloped edge of rolling purple clouds that peeped over the western wall. We're in for a storm. Oh, I hope not. I'm afraid of storms. Are you? Why? Have you ever been down in one of these walled-up pockets in a bad storm? No, now I think of it. I haven't. Well, it's terrible. Every summer I get scared to death and hide somewhere in the dark. Storms up on the sage are bad, but nothing to what they are down here in the canyons. And in this little valley, why, echoes can wrap back and forth so quick they'll split our ears. We're perfectly safe here, Bess. I know. But that hasn't anything to do with it. The truth is I'm afraid of lightning and thunder, and thunderclaps hurt my head. If we have a bad storm, will you stay close to me? Yes. When they got back to camp, the afternoon was closing, and it was exceedingly sultry. Not a breath of air stirred the aspen leaves, and when these did not quiver, the air was indeed still. The dark purple clouds moved almost imperceptibly out of the west. What have we for supper? asked Bess. Rabbit. Burn, can't you think of another new way to cook rabbit? went on Best with earnestness. What do you think I am, a magician? retorted Venters. I wouldn't dare tell you. But, Byrne, do you want me to turn into a rabbit? There's a dark blue, merry flashing of eyes and a parting of lips. Then she laughed. In that moment she was naive and wholesome. Rabbit seems to agree with you, replied Venters. You are well and strong, and growing very pretty. Anything in the nature of compliment he had never before said to her. And just now, he responded to a sudden curiosity to see its effect. Bess stared, as if she had not heard aright, slowly blushed, and completely lost her poise in happy confusion. I'd better go right away, he continued, and fetch supplies from Cottonwoods. A startlingly swift change in the nature of her agitation made him reproach himself for his abruptness. No, no, don't go, she said. I don't mean that about the rabbit. I was only trying to be funny. Don't leave me all alone. Bess, I must go sometime. Wait, then. Wait till after the storms. The purple cloud bank darkened the lower edge of the setting sun, crept up and up, obscuring its fiery red heart, and finally passed over the last ruddy crescent of its upper rim. The intense, dead silence awakened to a long, low, rumbling roll of thunder. Oh, cried Bess nervously. We've had big black clouds before this without rain, said Venters. But there's no doubt about that thunder. The storms are coming. I'm glad. Every rider on the sage will hear that thunder with glad ears. Venters and Bess finished their simple meal and the few tasks around the camp, then faced the open terrace, the valley, and the west to watch and await the approaching storm. It required keen vision to see any movement whatever in the purple clouds. By infinitesimal degrees, the dark cloud line merged upward into the golden-red haze of the afterglow of sunset. A shadow lengthened from under the western wall across the valley. As straight and rigid as steel rose the delicate, spear-pointed silver spruces. The aspen leaves, by nature pendant and quivering, hung limp and heavy. No slender blade of grass moved. A gentle splashing of water came from the ravine. Then again from out of the west sounded the low, dull, and rumbling roll of thunder. A wave, a ripple of light, a trembling and turning of the aspen leaves, like the approach of a breeze on the water, crossed the valley from the west, and the lull and the deadly stillness and the sultry air passed away on a cool wind. The night bird of the canyon, with clear and melancholy notes, announced the twilight. And from all along the cliffs rose the faint murmur and moan 
and mourn of the wind singing in the caves. The bank of clouds now swept hugely out of the western sky. In front was purple and black, with gray between, a bulging, mushrooming, vast thing, instinct with storm. It had a dark, angry, threatening aspect, as if all the power of the winds were pushing and piling behind. It rolled ponderously across the sky. A red flare burned out instantaneously, flashed from the west to east, and died. Then from the deepest black of the purple cloud burst a boom. It was like the bowling of a huge boulder along the crags and ramparts, and seemed to roll on and fall into the valley to bound and bang and boom from cliff to cliff. Oh, cried Bess, with her hands over her ears. What did I tell you? My best be reasonable, said Venters. I'm a coward. Not quite that, I hope. It's strange you're afraid. I love the storm. I tell you, a storm down in these canyons is an awful thing. I know Aldring hated storms. His men were afraid of them. There was one who went deaf in a bad storm and never could hear again. Maybe I've lots to learn, Bess. I'll lose my guess if this storm isn't bad enough. We're going to have heavy wind first, then lightning and thunder, then the rain. Let's stay out as long as we can. The tips of the cottonwoods and the oaks waved to the east, and the rings of aspens along the terraces twinkled their myriad of bright faces in fleet and glancing gleam. A low roar rose from the leaves of the forest, and the spruces swished in the rising wind. It came in gusts, with light breezes between. As it increased in strength, the lulls shortened in length, till there was a strong and steady blow all the time and violent puffs at intervals, and sudden whirling currents. The clouds spread over the valley, rolling swiftly and low, and twilight faded into a sweeping darkness. Then the singing of the wind in the caves drowned the swift roar of rustling leaves. Then the song swelled to a mourning, moaning wail. Then, with the gathering power of the wind, the wail changed to a shriek. Steadily the wind strengthened, and constantly the strange sound changed. The last bit of blue sky yielded to the onsweep of clouds. Like angry surf, the pale gleams of gray, amid the purple of that scudding front, swept beyond the eastern rampart of the valley. The purple deepened to black. Broad sheets of lightning flared over the western wall. There were not yet any ropes or zigzag streaks darting down through the gathering darkness. The storm's center was still beyond Surprise Valley. Listen, listen, cried Bess, with her lips close to Venter's ear. You'll hear Oldring's knell. What's that? Oldring's knell. When the wind blows a gale in the caves, it makes what the rustlers call Oldring's knell. They believe it bodes his death. I think he believes so, too. It's not like any sound on earth. It's beginning. Listen. The gale swooped down with a hollow, unearthly howl. It yelled and pealed and shrilled and shrieked. It was made up of a thousand piercing cries. It was a rising and a moving sound. Beginning at the western break of the valley, it rushed along each gigantic cliff, whistling into the caves and cracks, to mountain power, to bellow a blast through the great stone bridge. Gone as into an engulfing roar of surging waters, it seemed to shoot back and begin all over again. It was only wind, thought Venters. Here sped and shrieked the sculptor that carved out the wonderful caves and the cliffs. It was only a gale, but as Venters listened, as his ears became accustomed to the fury and strife, out of it all, or through it, or above it, Peeled low and perfectly clear and persistently uniform, a strange sound that had no counterpart in all the sounds of the elements. It was not of earth or of life. It was the grief and agony of the gale, a knell of all upon which it blew. Black night enfolded the valley. Venters could not see his companion, and knew of her presence only through the tightening hold of her hand on his arm. 
he felt the dogs huddle closer to him. Suddenly the dense, black vault overhead split asunder to a blue-white, dazzling streak of lightning. The whole valley lay vividly clear and luminously bright in his sight. Upreared, vast and magnificent, the stone bridge glimmered like some grand god of storm in the lightning's fire. Then all flashed black again, blacker than pitch, a thick, impenetrable coal blackness. And there came a ripping, crashing report. Instantly an echo resounded with clapping crash. The initial report was nothing to the echo. It was a terrible, living, reverberating, detonating crash. The wall threw the sound across, and could have made no greater roar if it had slipped an avalanche. From cliff to cliff the echo went in crashing retort, and banged in lessening power, and boomed in thinner volume, and clapped weaker and weaker, till a final clap could not reach across the waiting cliff. In the pitchy darkness, Venters led Bess, and groping his way, by feel of hand, found the entrance to her cave and lifted her up. On the instant, a blinding flash of lightning illuminated the cave and all about him. He saw Bess's face, white now, with dark, frightened eyes. He saw the dogs leap up, and he followed suit. The golden glare vanished. All was black. Then came the splitting crack and the infernal din of echoes. Bess shrank closer to him and closer, found his hands, and pressed them tightly over her ears, and dropped her face upon his shoulder and hid her eyes. Then the storm burst, with a succession of ropes and streaks and shafts of lightning, playing continuously, filling the valley with a broken radiance, and the cracking shots followed each other swiftly till the echoes blended in one fearful, deafening crash. Venters looked out upon the beautiful valley, beautiful now as never before, mystic in its transparent, luminous gloom, weird in the quivering golden haze of lightning. The dark spruces were tipped with glimmering lights, the aspens bent low in the winds, as waves in a tempest at sea. The forest of oaks tossed wildly and shone with gleams of fire. Across the valley, the huge cavern of the cliff-dwellers yawned in the glare, every little black window as clear as at noonday. But the night and the storm added to their tragedy. Flung arching to the black clouds, the great stone bridge seemed to bear the brunt of the storm. It caught the full fury of the rushing wind. It lifted its noble crown to meet the lightnings. Venters thought of the eagles and their lofty nest in the niche under the arch. A driving pall of rain, black as the clouds, came sweeping on to obscure the bridge and the gleaming walls and the shining valley. The lightning played incessantly, streaking down through opaque darkness of rain. The roar of the wind, with its strange knell and the recrashing echoes, mingled with the roar of the flooding rain, and all seemingly were deadened and drowned in a world of sound. In the dimming pale light, Venters looked down upon the girl. She had sunk into his arms upon his breast, burying her face. She clung to him. He felt the softness of her, and the warmth, and the quick heave of her breast. He saw the dark, slender, graceful outline of her form. A woman lay in his arms. As he held her closer, he who had been alone in the sad, silent watches of the night, was not now, and never must be again, alone. He who had yearned for the touch of a hand felt the long tremble and the heartbeat of a woman. By what strange chance had she come to love him? By what change, by what marvel had she grown into a treasure? No more did he listen to the rush and roar of the thunderstorm, for with the touch of clinging hands and the throbbing bosom he grew conscious of an inward storm, the tingling of new chords of thought, strange music of unheard, joyous bells, sad dreams, dawning to wakeful delight, dissolving doubt, resurging hope, force, fire, and freedom, 
unutterable sweetness of desire. A storm in his breast. A storm of real love. This is B.J. Harrison. I hope you've enjoyed this unabridged production of Riders of the Purple Sage, Part 6 of 12, by Zane Gray. If you've enjoyed this book, please become a monthly supporter by going to classictalesaudiobooks.com. Donate $5 a month and get a monthly coupon code for $8 off any audiobook order. It's a great way to build your library of classic literature. Thanks for pitching in. Thank you for joining me today and allowing classic literature to awaken your better self. Please join me every week and we'll rediscover the greatest stories ever put to paper. <laughs>